Hi, I would like to welcome you all to, for coming today. Thank you so much. I'm um, looking forward to an excellent series with Dr. Abeling. But first of all, some housekeeping issues. We'd like to thank our sponsors, the most important of which are the Templeton Foundations that have taken us on for the last three years now. And without them, we're not sure this would be possible. Compass Point has provided accommodations and we're very grateful. We also have some patrons that we need to mention. Donald Tomlinson, Go Ahead Biscuits, Arizona Drinks, our supporters, J.S. Johnson and Majestic Tours, and our donors, Bahamas First. They all help make this possible, of course, without Dr. Ebeling offering his expert uh, lectures, uh, it wouldn't be possible. And of course, none of it would be worth doing if we didn't have an audience to come and share it with us. So thank you so much. Enjoy Dr. Ebeling. All right, so uh, our last session of today is on, as you can see here, the fiscal crisis of our time, the ethics and economics of income taxes, VAT, and deficit spending. And in fact, I'm going to talk about the deficit spending aspect of this first and then get into the taxes. And uh, I want to start off by pointing out that, that, that through a good part of the 19th century, and I'm using the examples of the United States and Great Britain, through a good part of the 19th century and even into the 20th century, to the time of the First World War, uh, which began in 100 years ago in 1914, uh, for most of that time, Great Britain and the United States followed what, you, what we could call an unwritten fiscal constitution. I say unwritten because, for example, in the United States Constitution, there is no obligation for the U.S. government to run a balanced budget. Uh, it's often presented as a norm, a desirable fiscal or financial policy for, for the government, but there's nothing in the U.S. Constitution preventing the U.S. government from running a budget deficit. That is, spending more than it takes in in taxes and making up that difference by borrowing it. Now, in the United States, many of the 50 states actually have that in their constitutions. They have to have a balanced budget. Or if they do not run a balanced budget, it has to be for exceptional emergency situations, like some natural catastrophe in which they have to, in a very short time, borrow money, but it has to be paid back and they have to get back in balances in, you know, within a certain calendar year. But in spite of the fact that, obviously, the British Parliament and the U.S. Congress under the U.S. Constitution were not obligated to have a balanced budget, they did follow an unwritten fiscal constitution that, for the most part, uh, the U.S. government ran a, budget, uh, a balanced budget. In other words, it, it projected how much it was going to take in in taxes uh, during, the, uh, during the next fiscal year, which, of course, could never be perfect, but more or less then uh, projecting its spending to match its taxes. Were there exceptions to this? Yes. Uh, they were considered to be national emergencies. And in the case of the United States, uh, this usually happened during wars. A war breaks out. The government needs, in short order, a lot of extra money for military purposes. Uh, the U.S. government would borrow money, uh, fight a war. For example, uh, uh, we fought a second war with the British after our independence, uh, uh, the War of 1812, which was a very strange war that we claim we won, but that was only after the British landed on the east coast of the United States, uh, sailed and marched up uh, the, the, uh, the Chesapeake uh, River and burned down the White House and the Capitol building in Washington, D.C., uh, with the president, then James Madison, only escaping like, like a half hour before the British arrived. And then the one battle we won was the Battle of New Orleans. The, the British landed at the mouth of the Mississippi River, started marching up the river to the, you know, the famous port of New Orleans, but they were thrown back. But the only problem is, you know, transportation and communication was different back then. The time that battle was won, which was our major victory, the war was already over. You know, they signed a peace treaty in Europe, Several weeks before the battle, yeah, you didn't hear about it. So our one victory was after the war was over. But, uh, but obviously for that war, uh, the government borrowed money. Then there was the American Civil War. Uh, Lincoln's northern government uh, uh, borrowed large sums of money to fight the rebellion southern states. Uh, the southern states themselves ran a budget deficit. Uh, and then during the two world wars, uh, World War I and World War II, the U.S. government ran budget deficits. But through most of those wars, uh, uh, except for the Second World War. Uh, when the war crisis ended, uh, right after that, the United States government would run budget surpluses. 
That is, it would be taking in, in more in taxes than it was spending during that calendar year. And with that extra money above its spending, it would then pay off the debt. And so you would see a cycle, uh, for example, that, 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 the, that, that the, balance, the budget is pretty much ba balanced with, with zero debt or near zero debt. Then there's borrowing, so debt spikes up. And then it slowly goes down, not always reaching zero again, but getting pretty low before another war crisis occurred, marring. But it's sort of like, like this, and always returning to basically a balanced budget. Uh, now, the reasons for this uh, were, were several. Uh, and that basically was, as I say here, it was argued that a balanced budget made it easier and clearer for the citizens and the taxpayer to compare the costs and the benefits from government spending activities. Since each dollar spent by the government required a dollar collected in taxes to pay for what the government was doing, the citizen and the taxpayer could make a more reasonable judgment whether they considered any government spending proposal to be worth it in terms of what had to be given up to benefit from it. And that cost being one less dollar in the ta taxpayer citizens' pockets to spend the way they would want instead of the dollar being spent by the government. The trade-off was explicit. Any additional dollar of government spending on some program or activity required an additional dollar of taxes, and therefore the cost of one dollar less in the taxpayer's pocket to spend on some de desired private sector use instead. Or if taxes were not to be increased for, to pay for some new or expanded government program, the supporter of this increase had to explain what other existing government program or activity would be reduced or eliminated to free up and transfer existing government collected dollars to fund the proposed new spending. This balanced budget rule was an unwritten fiscal constitution, as I just said, because there's nothing in the constitution requiring it. But it was considered a wise and honest policy, as I say here, since the citizens and the taxpayers would always know what the real cost of everything was that the government was doing. The same way as you go into the supermarket, if you pick a can of corn off the shelf and you see the price on it, you know that's what it's going to cost you. And that's that many pennies or dollars less that you're going to have available in your wallet or your purse to spend on something else if you buy that extra can of corn. So you can compare the benefit, enjoying the corn, with what it's going to cost you, not spending the same sum of money on something else that could be enjoyable or valuable to you as well. In other words, the cost is easily matched by the benefit. For you to compare and contrast, is it worth it or not? Now, the problem is, is that beginning in the 1930s, this ended. Beginning in the 1930s with the rise of what's called Keynesian economics, it was argued that the government should not balance its budget on an annual basis, but instead the government should balance its budget over what's called the business cycle. Government should run budget deficits in, quote, bad years, that is a recession or a depression, supposedly to try to goose up the economy, and run budget surpluses in good years, that is periods of full employment and rising domestic, gross domestic product to rein in what we, you know, fearful inflationary forces. This new rule of a balanced budget over the business cycle became a generally accepted idea for fiscal policy among economists and policymakers. However, there has been one problem with this alternative conception of the role and method of managing government spending and taxing. And that is, over the approximately 67 years since the end of the Second World War, now it's actually 70 years, 1945, uh, the U.S. government has run budget deficits in, f in over 55 years. It's about 58 years now uh, out of that 70 years. Only 12 years have been uh, surplus years. And here's this one. This goes through 1940 to 19, 2012. I couldn't find, like, on the Internet where I got this one, you know, one that extended it to the present. But the policies remain the same. But this starts in 1940. The red are deficits. The greens are government surpluses. You can see which one is greater than the others. And here was with this, this, this re recession we, we've been going through or getting over from 2007, 2008, 2009, where for about three years, the U.S. government had trillion-dollar deficits. That's not total government spending. That's just the deficit part of the spending, trillion-dollar-a-year deficits. Now, there is no way to claim that except for 12 years, the U.S. economy was in a recession. It wasn't. Most of those years were normal economic growth years. But in spite of that, the government kept, kept running deficits, spending more than it took in and adding to the debt. 
the political incentives of deficit spending and the growing size and scope of government. That is the problem. Because once the balanced budget rule was eliminated and being superseded by this idea of balancing the budget over the business cycle, which really has never been practiced, it became possible for politicians to create an economic illusion and that it is as possible to give voters something for nothing, a free lunch. Politicians have been able to offer more and more government spending to special interest groups to obtain those contributions and votes that we talked about earlier today in the attempt to be elected and re-elected to political office. They can offer benefits in the present in the form of new or additional government spending, but they no longer have to explain where the money will come from to pay for it. The cost of that deficit spending is to be paid for by some unknown future taxpayer in some amount that can be put off discussing until that sometime in the future. Thus, politicians can supply those concentrated benefits that we talked about in the morning. In the present now, and avoid answering how the money will be paid back with interest, because that can be delayed until the future, a period later in time, years ahead, when someone else will hold political office and have to deal with the problem. In other words, the politicians can now offer people benefits without costs. Or implicitly say, I'm going to give you $10 of goodies, but I'm only going to tax you $6. Well, would you not take something that's worth 10 and pay Six for it? Of course. If you thought something was worth 10 and a person says you only have to pay six, that's a bargain, right? Of course. And that's implicitly what the government is doing. We're going to give you $10 worth of government spending goodies, but we're only going to tax you $6. Oh, we'll borrow the rest and, well, that'll be paid back in the future. Until now, the United States government has a debt, an accumulated debt, of about $18 trillion, $18 trillion. Now, the, 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 the fact that there are problems with this is not new. People have understood that, that government spending like this can get way out of control and should always be feared. And I'll just give two, uh, two examples. Uh, two famous Scottish philosophers and economists, David Hume and, of course, Adam Smith. Said David Hume in a famous essay of his written in 1741 of public credit, it is very tempting to a minister in the government to employ such an expediency as enables him to make a great figure during his administration without overburdening the people with taxes or exciting any immediate clamor against himself. The practice, therefore, of contracting debt will almost infallibly be abused in every government. It would scarcely be more imprudent to give a prodigal son a credit in every banker's shop in London than to empower a statesman to draw bills in this manner upon posterity. Well, sure, what politician isn't going to be tempted to take advantage of offering things to the electorate without telling them what it's going to cost or how much? And as Adam Smith said in his famous book, The Wealth of Nations, when national debts have once been accumulated to a certain degree, there is scarce, I believe, a single instance of their having been fairly and completely paid. The liberation of the public revenue, if it has been brought about at all, has always been brought about by a bankruptcy, sometimes by an avowed or admitted one, but always by a real one, though frequently by a pretended payment. The raising of the denomination of the coin, that is, debasement of the currency through inflation, has been the most usual expedient by which a real public bankruptcy has been disguised under the appearance of a pretended payment. Well, if government just prints up a bunch of money to pay back its national debt and all that paper money starts pushing up prices, a theme with inflation we'll talk about tomorrow morning in more detail, then as prices go up, what's the value of each dollar that the government's paying you back? It's worth less. So they're basically cheating you out of the money you've lent to the government through the rising prices of inflation. And so it appears as if they're paying back their debt, but in real buying power, they're giving you short change. And one other example I think is worth bringing out is from uh, Henry Fawcett and Millicent, For Millicent Fawcett from a series of essays and lectures that they published back in the 1870s. Uh, he was an interesting fellow. He's one of the, 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 one of the most famous British economists of the second half of the 19th century. You'll notice that his eyes are closed. He was blind. He had an, a riding accident. He hit a branch. And, you know, whatever it did as a concussion, he lost his sight. He was engaged to Millicent's sister, 
But the sister backed out because, you know, being married with a, a, man, a blind man. But, he, but, but, but Melissa, Millicent started helping him, and she fell in love with him. And in spite of her mother saying, don't marry him, this is a burden on you, you're going to have an invalid to care for, she married him. And they became partners in writing on economics topics. She's actually one of the, the handful of what are now famous female economists of the 19th century. She made a mark, not just jointly writing things with him, but her own little books on, like, like little primer books for kids on economics. Like what would be like a high school book. She and an assistant would read to him. He remembered everything, like a photograph. And then he would dictate his articles and books for them to write down from memory. Anyway, so they wrote about it, uh, and actually it's, it's more her essay than his in this instance from this book, uh, on, on the dangers and problems of deficit spending. When additional supplies of money are raised by additional taxation, everyone knows exactly how and to what extent he is injured and inconvenienced by the new impost, that is, by the taxes. If the government is going to spend more money and have to raise that, you know what it's cost you. They're not hiding it. Consequently, a strong pressure is brought to bear on the government to exercise increased economy and to cut down all expenditure that is not absolutely necessary. Excessive taxation, therefore, in a country possessing free political institutions brings with it its own remedy. But when a country is in the habit of resorting to loans, there is no guarantee that the money raised is spent economically, nor yet that there are any urgent necessity for the expenditure. And then they quote from a book by a Mr. Dudley Baxter, who was an American, a book that he had published actually the same year that they later wrote this essay, uh, a book called National Debts. And this is what Mr. Baxter says being quoted by them in their article. When money is raised by taxation within the year for which it is needed, the amount that can be raised is limited by the tax-enduring habits of the people and must be as small as possible in order not to provide discontent. What does discontent mean? If you keep raising taxes, the voters get upset and they may not re-elect you. That's discontent for the politician. By the same reason, it must be spent economically and made to go as far as possible. Because when the tax pay, taxpayers are paying for it, they're going to say, has this guy, I elected him, has he been spending my money wisely? Did we get the most out of it? But when the money is raised by loans, it is limited only by the necessity of the interest not to be too large for the taxable endurance of the people or provoking their voter discontent. Hence, the limits of borrowing are about 20 times larger than the limits to taxation. And an amount that is monstrous as a tax is apparently a very light burden as a loan. In consequence, borrowing is freed from the most powerful check that restrains taxation. When a loan is obtained, the reason, when a loan is obtained, the reason for economical expenditure is equally wanting. And borrowed money is commonly expended with much greater profuseness and often wastefulness than would be the case with taxes. Now, these truths, I would argue, that were written by them a long time ago, right? The 1870s, or even further back, David Hume and Adam Smith in the 1700s, is as poignant and insightful as a concern about the behavioral incentives on the part of politicians who are able to get elected and stay elected by promising constituencies things that they're going to spend money on by creating the illusion that, that it doesn't have to be paid for. And borrowing creates that illusion. This has been discussed in more modern times by two economists in a book that they wrote a number of years ago called Democracy and Deficit. The authors are James Buchanan. You know, he just recently died in his 90s. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1986 uh, as one of those developers of the public choice theory, right, explaining the logic of the political process with those economics reasoning that we discussed the, in the morning. Uh, and his co-authored Richard Wagner, who uh, is alive and well and is a professor of economics at George Mason University in uh, Fairfax, Virginia. But in their book, Democracy and Deficit, they also emphasize the, this bias and this illusion that, that, that deficit spending enables politicians to get away with. The pre-Keynesian or classical fiscal constitution was not written in any formal set of rules. It was nevertheless almost universally accepted. 
The dominant principle, one that was expressed clearly by Adam Smith and incorporated into the theory of economic policy, was that the resort to debt finance by government provided evidence of, of, of public uh, reckless extravagance that imposed fiscal burdens on subsequent, that is, the next generation of taxpayers. Put starkly, debt finance enabled the people living currently, today, to enrich themselves at the expense of people living in the future. Okay. That would be like you getting to sort of like your later years and not only spending all of your savings, but then racking up your credit cards and then dying. And legally, your kids are responsible to pay it off. Well, that's what he's saying here. The current generation borrows to have things in the present period, and then a good part of the burden to eventually pay it off is in the next generation, because the debt goes on for decades. <clears throat> Effective democratic government requires institutional arrangements that force citizens to take account of the costs of government as well as the benefits and to do so simultaneously. You have to connect the cost of the benefit. Like I said, you go into the supermarket or the department store or the clothing store, there's the price tag. You're going to pay it now to have the benefit of the thing you bought. And it's a clear thing. Do you think it's worth what you have to pay for it? Effective democratic government requires institutional arrangements that force citizens to take account of the cost of government as well as the benefits and to do so simultaneously. So people can't think they're getting something for free today and burdening somebody later on other than themselves. Under taxation, these costs are imposed directly on the citizens as determined by the existing rules for tax or cost sharing. Under public borrowing, by contrast, these costs are not imposed currently during the budgetary period where the outlays are made. Instead, the costs are postponed or put off until later periods when interest and amortization come due. Tax finance places the burden of payment squarely upon the members of the political community during the period when the expenditure decision is made. You want it, you pay for it now. Debt finance, on the other hand, postpones payment until interest and amortization payments on a debt come due. You get it now, you put off sight, uh, sight unseen until later. Debt finance enables these people living at the time of the fiscal decision to shift payments onto those living in the later periods. So to be honest, I assume, the, well, I know you have a deficit budget problem here too, don't you? And whether you're a slightly older person who's here in the audience or one of these younger people in the audience, to the extent that those borrowed dollars are giving you benefits and goodies now of whatever form, right? The government is spending it on something and you may be one of the beneficiaries to a greater or smaller extent or from several programs at the same time. You're placing a burden on others in the future. Now, you might live to be part of that future, but how do you know how much you're going to have to bear as a burden? It could be that if you knew how much of a future burden it was going to be to pay back as an individual taxpayer, you're part of the principal and the interest. It might you might decide that the benefit the government gives you today is less than what they're going to, you're going to have to pay as an individual taxpayer in the future. But you don't know that because who the hell knows is who the hell knows what their tax burden is going to be 10 years from now, what the tax laws will be, what your income bracket will be upon which you'll be taxed. So it's like in a fog of not knowing who's paying what, when, or by how much. And that's why it's self-delusional both for the current generation and for the future one. <clears throat> that is what makes deficit spending so dangerous. Now, I should mention one other thing. In the U.S., we have a thing called unfunded liabilities. What the hell is that? That's when, under current government legislation, people are eligible for government programs in the future. <clears throat> government retirement, known as Social Security, Medicare, partly government funding of health care, and now Obamacare, which is far more government-funded and supervised health care. So the law says, well, you, when you get to 65, you can collect the government Social Security pension. Uh, when you reach a certain age, you can start having all or part of your medical expenses covered by the government. And that's it. Once you that reach that age or that circumstance, you're eligible. The government can't do anything about it. The law says you have to get it. But all of those promises have not been funded. Where's the tax dollars today to cover all of that? 
Well, there's two trust funds that cover the Social Security fund, the pension fund in the U.S., and Medicare, that, that, that government partly funding health care that's been around since the 1960s. These two, these two trust funds have accountants, actuarials, and they operate with a time horizon of 75 years. That's, that's how far they look out into the future. You know, what, what, who's going to be eligible, what the tax revenues will be, how much out, outflow is going to go when people are eligible for this. And 75 years, what? That's like about to the end of this century, right? That's almost the end of the 21st century. Well, in the U.S., they estimate that these two government unfunded liability programs between now and 75 years from now are going to cost the U.S. government somewhere in the neighborhood of 90 to $125 trillion. That's not million, not billion, trillion dollars. Between 90 and $125 trillion. Depending upon how you, you're estimating the demographics of this, right? You know, well, if it's people, if the population grows this fast or the population ages this way and so on and so forth. Right? But that's the range. 90 to $125 trillion. The U.S. government currently takes in less than $4 trillion. The entire U.S. gross domestic product, right, the, the value of the economic pie, is only about $17.5 trillion, $18 trillion. Where's all this money coming from? Now, admittedly, it all, isn't all coming due in one year. But you see, it's going to be at an accelerated rate because, like in many countries, the American population is aging. So a larger proportion are going to be eligible for the programs, and the older you get... Other things held given you, the more likely you're going to need medical care and expensive medical care. So the costs are going to be like that. So that as years go by, the burden each year to find the funding for it is going to be accelerating. Where's this money going to come from? Like I said, who's going to cover our debt when we go bankrupt? Oh, yeah, the people on Mars and Venus and Pluto. Thanks. <clears throat> This is not alone. Europe suffers from this. Japan suffers from this. China has this one-child policy. So you have very few younger people entering the workforce age, and a lot of people who are getting old in China. They're going to have this problem, though they don't publicize it as much as we and the Europeans uh, talk about it. So this is a global problem. Now that gets us to the element of taxation. All taxation is compulsory. Right? You don't have a choice about it. As I've said a couple of times, try not to pay your taxes. Right? The government will visit you and see that you pay, right? right? It's so nice to know that someone wants to come and see you. Maybe not for the reason you'd like to be visited, but see, they care. They care if you don't pay your taxes. See, finally, they notice you. They're ignoring you every other time. But your money, boy, you're on their radar screen, that's for sure. It is a government taking a part of, of that which people have earned in the marketplace. And it clearly reduces the earned income in their pockets by the amount that the government extracts from them in the form of the tax. Now, there are different types of taxes. There can be what economists generally call indirect taxes, by which is meant that the taxes are not taken directly from the source, that is, the income, income earner himself. Indirect taxes are imposed often on the products of which people have contributed in manufacturing and the production processes. The sales tax is an indirect tax. Individuals decide what products they wish to buy and the quantities they're willing to pay for them at the price that includes both the cost of production and the tax imposed by the government at the point of sale. Okay? And you pretty much know it. You, you buy an item, and it says $100, and then you get to the checkout counter and, and the traditional sales tax they ring it up and plus 10 percent. And suddenly the, the, the salesperson says, that'll be $110, please. You're jolted awake. That, Damn it, I thought I was paying 100 bucks. 110. But that's what a traditional sale. And you see, there is one advantage of that. You know right up front what they're hitting you for. Okay, you know. They want 10 percent of the value of what you want. And they're attacking that, attaching that to the price. At least, they, at least you know what government is costing you in that sense, in the, for this. Then there are income taxes. Si uh, income tax siphon off a portion of that which people have earned at a point at which it is earned. Now, the income tax can be a flat tax or a progressive tax, just to give two examples for our purposes. With the, with the flat tax, the more that an individual earns, the more of that income he pays as a tax. 
A lot of people have, sometimes say, oh, it's the flat tax, the rich get away. No. No. For example, if a person earns $25,000 and there is a 10% flat tax, he pays $2,500. While another individual who earns, say, $100,000 pays $10,000 on the 10% flat tax rate. So the more you pay, earn, the more you pay even with a flat tax. Right? 10% of 100000 is going to be more than 10% of 25000 So the person who owns more is paying tax, high, more taxes. So this idea that somehow, if it's not a progressive income tax, uh, wealthier people or rich people somehow get away, it just ain't so. The arithmetic is not there. Then there's a, a, progress, a, a progressive income tax increases the amount an income earner pays to the government at a progressively higher rate at higher levels of income. For instance, a person who pays, say, 10% income, uh, 10 income tax rate at a level of income of $25,000 would pay that $25,000 would pay that $2,500 in income tax. If the, that individual's income were to rise to $50,000 a year with a progressive income tax rate uh, that, he, that, that he would, might pay instead of 20%, then he pays the government $10,000. And if, if, he, if it should be his income were to rise to $100,000 and the progressive income tax imposed a rate of 50%, right? the more you pay, the higher the income tax rate, that would mean a government tax burden of $50,000 on that individual. It has been argued by many economists that such a progressive income tax that involves, potential, uh, uh, involves potentially generating disincentives to work, save, and invest. With a flat tax, the marginal tax rate, that is the additional amount that the individual pays in taxes out of each additional dollar earned, remains constant, a flat rate of 10% in the example. But with a progressive income tax, the marginal tax rate increases at various threshold levels. When the individual now earns $50,000 rather than $49,999, the marginal tax rate jumps from $4,999 to $10,000 by earning that one extra dollar, right? Because you're below $50,000, okay, you're paying 10%. If you now jump up to $1 more, you're now in a higher marginal tax rate, and you end up paying $10,000. Well, is it worth earning one extra dollar to see your tax, taxes increase by almost double? No. So that may dissuade you from being interested in earning higher income. And then if your income were to rise from $99,999 with a tax burden of $19,999 to $100,000 of income, his tax burden on $1 increase in income would then go up to $50,000, right? Half in that progressive rate. Well, again, what's the incentive to keep earning more if the government not only takes more as a flat tax, but progressively increasing? So the cost of earning one more dollar is going up higher and higher. Now, this has been discussed by some economists in terms of what's called the Laffer curve, which is certainly not a laughing matter. That's Arthur Laffer. Famous economist from the University of Southern California, USC. He actually still is a professor there, though he came up with this idea quite a while ago. Named after Arthur Laffer, the Laffer curve expresses the idea that the marginal tax rate, the tax on each additional dollar earned, can influence people's incentives to work, save, and invest. And above a certain level, the marginal tax rate may bring in less rather than more tax revenue to the government. Now, in, in this example, Let's suppose the marginal tax rate is zero, right? The government taxes you zero on your income. How, uh, how much revenue does the government take in? This is not a trick question. Zero. Now, let us suppose that, th that they would have a marginal tax rate of, you know, of 100%, right? They took $100 out of every $100 you earned. How much of an incentive do you have to work? Right? Oh, boy, I get to work for free for the government. They take everything I earn. Happy days are here again. <clears throat> now, let us suppose that the government started decreasing the marginal tax rate. Right? They're taking not 100% or 80%, but 50%. Now, there might be some people who would say, well, you know, 50% is still a lot. I work for a dollar and I get to keep half of it. But I'd rather get 50 cents than nothing. So they'll work more. And as they start working more, the government takes in more tax revenue because there are more dollars being earned of which the government is taking half. 
Now the government decides, in this just simple arithmetic example, lowers the marginal tax rate to 40%. 40%. So now you get to keep 60 cents out of each dollar that you earn. And there's going to be some people who say, well, I wasn't willing to work much more when it was a 50%, but if they let me keep 60%, I'd be willing to work a little bit more. It's worth it to have that extra amount out of each dollar. So more people work to earn dollars, and the government revenue rises again. And then it would reach some zenith. Again, this is not meant to be empirical numbers, just hypothetical ones for the sake of the example. So imagine a marginal tax rate of 30%. Out of each additional dollar, the government takes 30 cents. The government would take in some maximum amount. Now, on the other hand, if it lowered the marginal tax rate further, from 30 to 20% to 10%, again, its total revenue would go down. Now, some people would say, well, then the marginal tax rate should be the maximum. Why? Why should government have the most revenue? The question is, what is it that you think government should do? Now, we've discussed some things earlier, and people raised some questions. So obviously, there's a legitimate debate and discussion what you think should go government should do. Should government be this small with these functions? Should it be a little bigger with these many functions, or a little bit larger still with additional functions? But Whatever the, your, your view, well, that's the level of government you think is necessary in society. And you would estimate, well, how much money does the government need to do the functions that you think it should do? Why take more than that? If it's going to cost $100 to do a job, why should you be taxed more than the $100? Leave the rest in your own pocket. So let us suppose <clears throat> that it was estimated that to do whatever you thought were the legitimate and necessary functions of government... It was going to cost, for the government to do those functions, let's say here, <clears throat> $2 trillion. Right, again, just for the sake of the example. Now notice, there are two levels of marginal tax rates that can generate the same $2 trillion. You can get $2 trillion if you have a marginal tax rate of 10%, and you can have $2 trillion of a marginal tax rate of 50%. Let me suggest that the preferred marginal tax rate should be 10%. Why? It gives you the $2 trillion that you've decided is the necessary funding to cover the thing, things that you think government should do. Fair enough. That's a different debate as to what you think government should do. That's what you think government should do. <clears throat> and it leaves $0.90 cents out of each dollar for people in the private sector to find productive and profitable ways to devote to savings, investment, industry, technological innovation as well as as consumers, to just have more discretion to buy the things that are important to you while still funding what you think the government should do. Whereas if you tax it at the 50% marginal rate, you still only get the same $2 trillion, but you have reduced dramatically the amount out of each dollar available for those productive private sector activities, as well as reducing your just discretion as an income-earning consumer to have as much as you'd like to possibly have to buy the things that you want. So what would be the optimal policy? You get the $2 trillion that you think government needs to do the things you want government to do, and you leave $0.90 cents out of each dollar in the pockets of the people who have earned the income. This would be the optimal marginal tax rate in this type of framework. See the logic of that. Now, uh, the one other thing I wanted to touch upon was uh, the value-added tax, which I know that's become a hot topic here in, uh, in the Bahamas. I've not had a hot, an opportunity uh, to follow much of the particulars and specifics of it. Uh, Mr. Lowe uh, shared a couple of articles from the local newspapers, uh, but I certainly cannot speak about the concrete, specific particulars. But there are economic arguments about the general influences or effects or impacts of a tax such as a uh, value-added tax. And I draw upon an article from an economist from Murray Rothbard, Murray Rothbard actually wrote about this long ago, over 40 years ago. <clears throat> How about a tax that remains totally hidden, that the consumer or average American cannot identify and pinpoint as the object of his wrath? Right? You can know, damn it, look, they've raised the sales tax to 20% from 10%. They're taking more money out of everything I buy. Or they've raised the income tax. Damn it, they now take 
40 cents out of each dollar I earn, or earn instead of 30 cents out of each dollar, right? You know that, and you know what's causing it, and you see it. But what about a tax that remains totally hidden, that the consumer or average American cannot identify and pinpoint as the object of his wrath? The VAT is essentially a national sales tax, levied in proportion to the goods and services produced and sold. But its delightful concealment comes from the fact that the VAT is levied at each step of the way in the production process, on farmer, manufacturer, jobber, wholesaler, and only slightly at the retailer, where you meet him as a consumer in the retail store. The difference is that when a consumer pays a 7% sales tax on every purchase, his indignation rises and he points a finger of resentment at the politicians in charge of the government. Damn it, they are charging me 6% on everything I buy. But if the 6% tax is hidden and paid by every firm rather than just at retail, the inevitably higher prices will be charged not to the government where it belongs, but it will be, gra but it'll be, but it'll be grasping businessmen and avarice trade unions who are accused of it. There's those greedy businessmen, they keep jacking up the prices. No. If the prices of goods are rising, it's because the cost of manufacturing are going up through the production stages leading to the final finished good that you buy, because at each stage, the government is charging you a tax. But you don't see it as visibly and completely as when you buy that good at the store and there's $100 plus the 7 or 10% more. So the government hides from you what they're really charging you for the things that they buy, you buy. It is now easy to see the enthusiasm of the federal government and its economic advisors for the new scheme for a VAT. It allows the government to extract many more funds from the public to bring about higher prices, lower production, and lower incomes. And you totally ex escape the blame, which can easily be loaded on business, unions, or the consumer, as the particular administration in power may see it. Rothbard then goes on. The VAT, like a sales tax, is a regressive tax, falling largely on the poor and the middle class who pay a greater percentage of their income than the rich. This is a proper and important criticism, especially coming at a time when the middle class is already suffering from an excruciating tax burden. But the VAT is in many ways worse than a sales tax, apart from its hidden and clandestine nature. In the first place, the VAT advocates, advocates claim that since each firm and stage of production will pay in proportion to its value added to production, there will be no misallocation effects along the way. But this ignores the fact that every business firm will be burdened by the cost, uh, by, by the cost of innumerable record keeping and collections for the government. The result will be an inexorable push of the business system towards mer vertical mergers and the reduction of competition. Let's save by merging our firms together rather than my selling to you and you buying from me and then two charges of value added. See, that's going to diminish competition. It's going to create, I'm not saying in each and every case, but in some cases, at least an incentive to think about it on the part of some industries, let's merge to avoid the VAT when we trade, but you know, I make this and then sell it to you because it goes on next. Then we're one firm and we have a lower VAT because we're we eliminate an exchange in the process. The cost, okay. The cost of record keeping and the payment pose another grave problem for the market economy. Obviously, small firms are less able to bear the cost than the big ones. And so the VAT will be a powerful burden on small business and hamper it gravely in the competitive struggle. It is no wonder that some big businesses Look with favor at the VAT. <laughs> We're going to drive our little competitors out of business because it becomes more expensive for them to handle all that bookkeeping and tax collecting. <laughs> Again, you know, those government business crony capitalists getting together. One of the Parkinson's uh, justly famous laws is, uh, laws is that for government, expenditure rises to meet incomes. If we allow the government to find and exploit new sources of tax funds, it will simply use those funds to spend more and more and aggravate the already burdensome burden of big government on the American economy and the American citizen. I would suggest you can substitute Bahamian economy and the Bahamian citizen. The only way to reduce big government is to cut its tax revenue and to force it to stay within its own limited means, a balanced budget. We must see to it that the government has less tax funds to play with, not more. 
The first step on this road to lesser government and greater freedom is to see that the VAT, to see the VAT for the swindle that it is, and to send it down in defeat. Because there was a proposal when Rothbard wrote this article in the 1970s to have a value-added tax in the United States at a federal level, right, across the whole country. And fortunately, it was defeated. We do not have a VAT in the U.S. But occasionally, it is a proposed, once again, right, the monster rises up. And then we would have all the things that, let me suggest, are potential problems and burdens that he's talking about that you, you might be experiencing soon. Okay. This is the problem with this VAT. Now, I, I was interviewed on, on a radio show the, the other day um, here in the Bahamas when I arrived on Wednesday. And one of the issues that came up uh, in the discussion was, what did I think of the uh, policy suggestions, suggestions in quote mark, from organizations like the International Monetary Fund uh, to the Bahamian government that they needed to, to get rid of their deficit spending by generating more revenue, raising taxes. Okay. Was this a good thing? And my response was no. Because the problem is not the taxing of the borrowing, but the total level of spending. And let me get this by quoting from another famous economist, Milton Friedman, uh, winner of the Nobel Prize in uh, 1976. Keep your eye on one thing and one thing only, he wrote back in 1983. How much government is spending, because that's the true tax. If you're not paying for it in the form of explicit taxes, you're paying for it indirectly in the form of inflation or in the form of government borrowing. The thing you should keep your eye on is what the government spends. And the real problem is to hold down government spending as a fraction of our income. And if you do that, you can stop worrying about the debt. The key problem is not deficits, but the size of government spending. I have never supported an amendment directly directed solely at a balanced budget. I have written repeatedly that while I prefer that the budget be, balanced, be in balance, I would rather have government spend $500,000 and run a deficit of 100, uh, excuse me, $500 billion dollars and run a deficit of $100 billion, than have it spend $800 billion with a balanced budget, which means everything is being taken to taxes. It matters greatly how the budget is balanced, whether by cutting spending or by raising taxes. Yeah, if the government spends $500 billion but only collects $400 billion in, in tax revenues, yeah, it's going to have to borrow $100 billion to make up the difference. But what's important is the total amount of resources, either taxed or borrowed, that the government is siphoning out of the economy, which is that burden on us as citizens. And what Friedman is saying is that that is a lower burden, even though one-fifth of it, 20%, is, is, is through deficit spending, than if the government collected $800 billion and spent $800 billion. That is the difference in the burden. I, he's saying I'd rather have a $500 billion government burden of taxes plus borrowing than an $800 billion burden all funded by taxes because that is the greater burden. What you need to do here is not raise more taxes given the level of spending to avoid borrowing, but to devise ways, again, separate from the wider dis argument of what do you think the roles and functions of government be? Whether you're left, right, or, or center politically, are not there things that you think government's doing that it could do less of or not at all? From where you are on the political spectrum, there's got to be something that you're saying, what the hell is the government spending this money for? Well, well, people need to form coalitions to get those things down, left, right, and center. Does that mean you're finally going to all agree, well, this is the right size of government? No, some people are going to want government to do this, others are going to want to only do that. But the first step is to realize that from every point, everyone's point of view, government is out of control spending in directions that everyone from one perspective or another thinks it shouldn't need to or is spending too much to slow down the rate. Right? You may be heading for a cliff, but it's better to be heading towards a cliff only at 80 miles an hour than 100 miles an hour. You're still threatened with that big damage over the cliff, but at least you're slowing down the rate to figure out ways to stop before you reach the edge. That is the problem. And the crucial problem is what I have here, I'm putting this picture of Friedman up here, 
that included a quote, I think the government solution to a problem is usually as bad as the problem and very often makes the problem worse. That has been a basic theme underlying a lot of what I've talked about. It's not only the question, should government do X and Y? That is the basic, most fundamental philosophical question. What is the role of government? How big should the government be to do those functions? And I think you've had an impression, if you've listened to the lectures so far yesterday and today, uh, I have a view that the government does far more than it should legitimately and necessarily. But not only is that a question, as Friedman is saying here, that road to hell is paved with good intentions. When you turn to the government solution, it often becomes worse rather than better. Let me explain these kind of unintended consequences, where it's supposedly a government solution to a problem that makes it worse. You probably know that there are white people and black people in the United States. You probably read that in a book somewhere. <laughs> Saw it on, in a movie. Anyway, and there's long been a concern about the difficulty of large numbers of people in the black community in America get, catching up with the standard of living with, with many in the white community. And the concern about broken families. Right? Household led by an, an, an unmarried mother or you know, f father has deserted the family, kids out of wedlock. And a lot of sociologists and political scientists worry about the stability of a household environment and bringing up kids when there's only one parent and out of marriage and all the other business. Some economists, including Friedman and others, have argued that this has actually been part of the unintended negative effects of these government programs. For instance, if you go back to the 1930s and 1940s, there's an interesting statistical phenomenon. There are future, fewer, there are fewer births out of wedlock among the American black community than the white community. There's fewer households led by an unmarried mother in the black community than the white community back in the 1930s and 1940s, in fact, through most of the 1950s you start seeing, quote, the disintegration of the American black family in the 1960s. Why? Because that was a big growth in the welfare programs. Oh, you want to be well eligible for welfare. Well, you can't have a job. And you cannot have a male living in the household to be eligible for the programs. Well, to be eligible for the programs, what do you do? The male member of the family, whether married or not, has to get out. And that put a cut in the traditional black American cultural family. And it's from that point on, and I'm not saying one cause, right? The world is affected by many causes and variables at the same time. But it perhaps cannot be denied that one significant influence on the breakup and weakness, looking at the broad sense, of many segments of the American black family are these programs that created perverse incentives not to get married, but have kids. Why? The more kids, the more payment you get per head child. And not to have a guy around, because then you're not eligible. That's a perverse unintended consequence. Another perverse unintended consequence. Why might black Americans, all other things held given, be earning less than white Americans? Education. Give a person an education, they're more equal to be qualified in the workplace, right? Reasonable, minus anything else. So now we're going to have affirmative action, right? Quotas, either implicit or explicit. Certain number of people in the black community have to be taken at these schools. The pro and the schools get money from the government for accepting minority students. What's the problem? Because of the poor quality below the college level of grammar school or high school, it's a pervasive problem whether you're white, black, purple, or green. There is a terrible, le as, a, as, a, as a teacher, as a professor, 
the degree of, of illiteracy by everyone, I don't care whether they're white or black, compared to when I was a student, they, people can't read, they can't write, it's terrible. But in relative terms, it tends to hit the black community more. A lot of schools and black communities are very poor. But now, you say that there has to be acceptance of a certain minority percentage in every school, even if those schools have higher standards for which these young men and women just do not have the educational background to make it. You're setting them up to fail. When if you hadn't imposed these, and this young black man or woman had gone to admittedly a second or third rung college university rather than the Harvard or the Yale or the Princeton, but had been with peers who were equivalent to them to try to finish the degree, rather than either getting through with unbelievably low grades or dropping out because they discover they can't make it. Give another example of perverse policies, the drug laws in the United States. Have to stamp out drugs. Unfortunately, the vast majority of, of people incarcerated, a, a large majority of the people incarcerated in American prisons are black. It is estimated that at one time or another, one out of, one out of every six males will have served prison time in the United States. Often having to do, you know, living in the black communities in one way or another, direct, indirect, big way, little way, with, with, with gangs and, 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 and the drug traffic. That what happens, happens to the future of people in these communities? What happens when one-sixth of the black male community are in prisons for one period of time in terms of family networks? Yes, it's good to prevent drugs, but this is part of the unintended consequence. Was it done intentionally to fall, fall disproportionately on the black community in America? No, but it has. So policies with good intentions can have undesirable secondary or side effects, unintended consequences, that often hurt some of the very people who you claim the policy was meant to help. I consider these outrages. Again, not because of bad intention. These laws weren't pissed like, yep, let's make it more difficult for black Americans. No, usually it's by people, oh, we have to help people who are less well off, who've had discrimination in the past. But that doesn't change the fact that policies can have consequences quite different from what you had hoped for, and in fact can make some people's lives worse than they were even before. This is important in understanding and analyzing in our economics. A lot of people don't like economics. Economists are like the party poopers. We keep reminding you of the costs of everything. Like, 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 like government spending. Oh, you want government spending? Where's the money coming from? Oh, you're a party pooper. It sounded so nice that the government was going to give me this. And people don't like that. Oh, you know, this is another. Oh, why don't you like these problems? You must hate black people. No, it's precisely because I would like everybody to have a chance. They don't want these policies that backfire. Economics is therefore one of the most misunderstood but profoundly important disciplines. Economics is not easy. It's not everybody's cup of tea. It requires you to put on a different sort of pair of glasses to look at and understand the world. But, you know, sometimes a pair of glasses may be difficult to wear at first because, you know, your eyes have to adjust to it. But once they do, things are a lot clearer. And economics, though not an easy subject, and not everyone's cup of tea, you put it on, Oh, so that at least helps me to understand part of how the world works and why some things turn out the way you want and other times they don't. And certainly seeing the world as clearly as you can is a plus rather than a negative. Thank you very much. Okay, comments, reflections, questions, yes. No, the Congress does have the authority. I mean, the U.S. Constitution. U.S. Constitution has the authority to tax. The federal government has the authority to tax through the Constitution? Yes. Okay. Yes. 
uh, it, it enumerates various taxes, one of which originally was not the income tax. Uh, Lincoln imposed an income tax during the American Civil War to raise funds for the northern side. Uh, there was an attempt again in the 1870s or 1880s to pass an income tax. Both of those times, the Supreme Court declared them unconstitutional. That is, the literal reading of the Constitution, the federal government could not impose an income tax. So the income tax itself is unconstitutional? It was up until uh, 1913 when an amendment was added to the Constitution through the normal constitutional procedure for doing so, which uh, established an income tax. Now, some people have questioned the, the pre procedure, but the fact is it's constitutional because it's a constitutional amendment according to the, the rules of how you amend the Constitution. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Question first, um, if we have time, a comment. If the U.S. was supposed to privatize the military, how do you think they'd be able to fund it? Well, I haven't talked about privatizing the military. Uh, I, I have certain, I know certain people who would like to privatize the military, uh, but I have no idea whether that would be practically viable or possible. You remember uh, yesterday when we were talking, I, I listed things of Adam Smith's system of natural liberty. What, according to Adam Smith, what should the government do? One of them was national defense, which involves the military. Uh, and if you believe that that is a legitimate function of the government, Army, Navy, Air Force now, uh, then, uh, based upon the degree of a threat that was evaluated uh, as needing uh, national defense from, then that would be the basis upon which you would decide the funding. Uh, but I also pointed out when I talked about homeland security that precisely because these are things that are not bought and sold, and you, the consumer, cannot directly decide how much you want and what you think it's worth, we never know whether we've spent too much or too little or gotten the right things with national defense any more than homeland security with government snooping. Uh, and that remains a fundamental problem. Uh, some people have proposed even privatizing uh, the military. Um, I, 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 that's obviously very controversial. Um, I, I take a different view as an advocate of liberty. I consider that the government is far bigger than I'd like it to be or even those who would like to privatize the military think it should be. So I'd rather figure out ways to get the government real small and then sometime way in the future when government is just police, courts, and defense, we can decide whether we can privatize the, the soldier as well. But that's a moot issue as far as I'm concerned. Yes? Um, so you said about the value added tax. Yeah. I'm looking at it in, in, in comparison with the, the income tax in America. The same way the value added tax is, you say, has a, has a sound side Mm -hmm. to the economy right. and to the regular citizen, at least a small man. Does, does the income tax system of America have that same effect, although, although um, every certain, every end of the year or beginning part of the year, they, they get a return on it? Mm -hmm. um, in, in a world with no perfect solutions as to how you're going to raise money for government, uh, I would consider that uh, of, uh, the, the, the least bad method in fact, would be not a value-added tax, for the reasons I tried to explain following Murray Rothbard's argument, um, but a national sales tax. Why? Because the only tax collected is at the final stage of sale. The only tax inconvenience and burden is for the retailer who keeps a record, well, this is the sales I made, and you know, as a percentage, this is what I owe to the government. What, is, what, what I consider pernicious about the income tax at one level, rather not just the disincentives of it, on people's work, savings, and investment, is that it gives the government the rationale to justify prying into and snooping into every aspect of your life. Have you earned a dollar somewhere from doing something that the government has a right to? Okay, some fraction that it has a right to. So they you check your records, look at your, what, you, what you're doing to earn a living, uh, your private affairs, your computer, uh, your relationships with people, because you, know, you might have you know, bought and sold something, including your own labor services, off the books, right? To keep, you know, not to pay taxes. So, so the income tax gives the, 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 the government the perverse 
rationale to, to become the ultimate for, for financial surveillance agent into each and every American in the country. Whereas if you just had a, an end of purchase sales tax, right, at the consumer end, it's a burden for retailers, but it's only, you know, the number of retailers in America, of all businesses, still remains a fraction of the total population. So the burden falls upon a handful of people as opposed to everybody, and we would know more directly what it's costing us. Now, I assume that you have withholding income tax here. The government takes out the tax before you get paid each week or each month. When do, when, how, how do you pay your income tax here? You don't have an income tax? No, we do pay national insurance. Okay. But you see, in the United States, since World War II, uh, out of each paycheck, they already take uh, how much you owe for income tax, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, unemployment insurance, and you only get the net amount after the government has taken its... Now, people get desensitized. They start looking at their take-home pay and say, well, that's my salary, and forget how much the government has taken out. My proposal is that if you have any kind of an income tax, as, like it was before the first, Second World War, you pay in one lump sum once a year. One lump sum once a year. Now, federal elections are held uh, the second Tuesday of November, right? So any presidential election, any U.S. congressional election, it's always the second Tuesday of, of, of November in any year where they hold an election. My proposal is that everybody has to pay their full income tax in one giant lump sum the week before they go to vote. You get that? They have to pay the entire year's income tax in one lump sum the week before they get vote. I would suggest that's going to change people's attitudes a lot about what they're paying for and whether they want to spend that much on it. Now, of course, that's precisely why no politician in Washington will ever vote to change the tax collection policy. But that, that's, that's what I would like to see. Because, in fact, that's what it was before the Second World War. Americans paid their income tax in a lump sum on, on, uh, I, uh, on April 15th. So you either had to save up during the year or borrow money to pay off whatever you ended up owing and then paying back the loan that enabled you to pay the tax. Yes? Are um, drug laws just the government treating us like Julie the little girl all the time and can't make a decision for ourselves in the first place? With the tax laws? So the, I mean, no, the drug laws. You said how oh, the drug laws. You said how uh, the drug laws are good intentions, but aren't they, are they cheating us? Uh, they're treating us like we can't decide what yes. we're doing. Uh, I, I meant it in the following way that the motive of people, they say, well, we, we support drug laws, anti-drug laws, uh, because we think it's criminal, it hurts people, but then it has all these unintended consequences separate from their own motive. If you ask me about the drug laws per se, I would say that they, they're victimless crimes. Is drug taking right or good? No. If I was wearing my moral philosopher hat here only, I would, I would, I'd be willing to give a hellfire and brimstone sermon on, on the dangers and evils of taking poisons into your body that ruin your mind uh, and your physical capacity. And that you have one life with one potential, and why personally destroy it by taking poisons into your body that can ruin you and have terrible side effects on those who care about you as they watch you waste away in these, in these terrible habits. And I, I would say that, and I would mean every word of it. But if I'm wearing my economist hat, and not, per se, my moral philosophy hat, what I would say is, is that from an economic point of view, having anti-drug laws generates a whole array of unintended consequences that are damaging to both drug addicts and innocent victims in society. It's illegal, so how do you get your drugs? Through illegal drug dealers. How do you know about the purity or the fineness of the drug? How do you know what it's cut with? Where do you get the needles to shoot up with? How do you know that they're hygienic? That you're not, that you're not getting an infection that's going to kill you? Okay. How do people get the money? Since it's illegal, drugs are other things held equal, uh, equal, far more expensive than if they were just open and available like something off the shelf in the drugstore, the pharmacy. Where do a lot of people get their, their drug money? 
they have to resort to crime. So there's a spillover. A lot of innocent people, innocent people who are the victims of those who are trying to get the money to keep up their habit. What happens to the political and legal system? It's pervasively corrupting. The police are bribed and bought off. District attorneys, right, government attorneys, lawyers are, 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 are bought off or bribed. Judges sometimes are bribed or blackmailed in terms of saying that the evidence is unacceptable or to get a, a lighter sentence for people. It results in this huge growth of a, of a prison population with all of the types of negative effects that I referred to a few minutes ago. So from the economist's point of view, it's a disaster. Now in a free society, I think that anybody should be able to do anything they want. But as a human being who's concerned with the well-being of his fellow men in general, if I saw anyone on drugs, I would try to persuade them just as a human being not to take it. But I don't believe there should be laws against it. First, you're a free person. If you want to kill yourself, you're free to do it. They'll all try to persuade you not to. But there certainly shouldn't be laws against it because it also has all these negative spillover effects. So morally, it would be more evil to force somebody to take up the choice, like the laws do, yes. than uh, yes. to try to persuade them. That's the because you see, that once you start uh, limiting the taking of a narcotic, where do you stop? Have there not been societies who have said, you know, not only are there bad substances to drink or ingest, but there are bad books? And have not some people said there are bad religions? So where do you stop? Because there's always someone who's going to think an idea or a faith or a, or, or a way of living is evil and immoral. And once you allow government into people's lives in these intimate ways, it always runs the risk of a snowball effect. Right. Support, um, plenty judges were bribed, plenty of police. I mean, Al Capone had it on lock. And um, right. right now, in our society, I, I see not only like marijuana and other drugs, and I'm still, you know, they have a thing, uh-huh. Molly and um, ecstasy and all that. Mm-hmm. Brothers taking them, and they, they just having a nice time, brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. But since the 1930s, I lived in America for a while also. I've watched alcohol, I mean, like, not only black families, also white families. Um, mm-hmm. You can totally destroy it over it. So, I mean, like, mm-hmm. they have it legal just about every corner you go and you can right. find a bar, especially right. in, the, in, the, in, the, in the minority <coughs> communities. Um, so you just find the young brothers, some in school and so forth, they may not be able to buy it. When I was in school in, the, in America, um, we, we couldn't get, we weren't at the age to get it. But, you know, you would know a big cousin or a friend who was a little older who could go and get it. And it's mm-hmm. happening right there. Now, actually, in the Bahamas, it's worse because in some, in, some, in some shops, you could go as a little boy, 12, 13, and buy a cigar and buy a cigarette. But in America, that's the, the store and plenty of problems if that happens, you know? Right. Well, the, the, the thing is, is that the very point you raise is, is, the, is the absurdity of, of making these things illegal. Mm-hmm. If, if people want things which they think... Uh, has unjustifiably or stupidly been made illegal. And if they're willing to pay a price high enough to cover the expenses of someone to supply it illegally to them, they will. It happened with uh, alcohol prohibition. In 1920, an amendment was added to the U.S. Constitution declaring the production, distribution, sale, purchase, and use of alcoholic beverages was constitutionally against the law. And that law remained in effect until 1933 when they added another amendment repealing the earlier one. For that 13-year period, you had the emergence of bootlegger gangs selling illegal uh, alcohol. I believe some of it actually came from here. Uh, All of you have heard of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy. His father, Joe Kennedy, made part of his fortune in the 1920s being an illegal booze uh, dealer bringing in alcohol from Canada. All you do is to corrupt the society. You, you have gangland fights. See, once they ended out prohibition in 1933, that, that crime due to that disappeared. 
right? You didn't have Al Capones. You, you, you didn't have gangland street fights where you're fighting over, you know, alcohol, illegal alcohol territories. You weren't bribing government officials, at least for that. It, all the crime was taken out of it. And you could be assured of the fineness and purity of, of what you were buying. And in fact, there's no more alcohol drinking now than there was at the beginning of the 20th century. All you can try to do is, is to, as a concerned person about a friend, a family member, if you see that for whatever psychological problem in themselves, they, they, they have fallen upon using a crutch, alcohol, a narcotic, you must try to do all you can just as a caring human being to assist them to get over this. But making it illegal just drives it underground. It doesn't solve the problem and has, and has all these layers of other negative effects. That's the tragedy of it. Yeah. No, no, over there. Yeah. We live in a strong democracy. Right. And the government beforehand had a little mess egg to pay the government to work with. Yes. Then you had other administrations came and they throw off the little mess egg. Yes. So we have nothing to go on. You have no, le- no, you have no eggs left in your nest. Right. And we now accept the vast um, taxation to now fund our government work. Right. What will happen, in my opinion, is that the tendency for politicians will be to take everything they get from the VAT and then spend more. They will not solve the problem. Okay. They'll, they'll placate the international organizations like the International Monetary Fund. Well, you see, we've reduced the, def- the deficit spending. But if you now take what's the extra taken in taxes plus what they're still spending over taxes you're still going to have a deficit problem. And then in the next election, they'll find ways to rationalize spending more and finding ways around any promises they've made to the international organizations. So I, I, you, in other words, you have to starve them. You cannot solve the weight problem by feeding them more. If someone has a weight problem, you have to cut down how much you eat. And that's the taxes uh, they take in, the spending in general. Yes. Yes. I don't know of any, but do you know of any country, yes. especially a third world country, that follow the dictate of international monetary fund and their economy was turned around? I'm thinking of where I'm from. I'm from Jamaica. Mm-hmm. Back in Jamaica, I've now reached 16.5%. And my fear is that eventually, here is going to end up like there. Yeah. The is going to keep on going up. Is there any country that you know that received, that followed the, the dictates of international monetary policy and your economy actually was turned around? Because Jamaica certainly wasn't turned around. The more we took, the, the worse we got. Often, historically, uh, over, the year, over the decades that the International Monetary Fund has been around since 1945-46, uh, it has tended to institute and propose policies uh, that I consider counterproductive. It has made raising taxes, uh, uh, increasing certain spending with higher taxes, and I consider those uh, counterproductive. Um, standing right here, I'm sure that there, I, I probably could find one or two examples where they offered different kind of advice that worked, but traditionally the kind of advice that they've offered in many of the countries that you know, I know about from reading things, they have tended to make that country's problems worse and not better. So yes, I agree with you. Makes it worse, not better. Now, there are, country, there are parts of the world that have followed low tax, low regulation, uh, low limitation on freedom policies, and have prospered. Hong Kong, somewhat in Singapore. Uh, excuse me? Texas, Texas yes. Texas has no income tax. The state of Texas has no income tax. It has relatively low regulation or, or competitive restrictions. And since the recession uh, of 2007-2008, it is the part of the country, the state of the, the entire United States, uh, that has had the highest gro- job 
recreation of any other part of the country. So right policies do bring about right results. Another example is Estonia in Eastern Europe. Uh, they cut spending, reduced taxes even more than they cut spending, paid off some of the debt that they had acquired, and they recovered and have been, admittedly, they're a little country, but a, a, a growth pattern for, uh, and a stable financial situation compared to many of their Eastern European neighbors. So yes, right policies bring about right results. That is growth and employment. Anything else? Well, it, 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 the IMF often comes in because the, the, the country in question uh, has found it difficult to continue borrowing from private sources, if nothing else, to finance uh, previous debt that's coming due, both principal and interest. Um, if that is the case and you don't want the IMF to come in, then you have to figure out a way to make lenders have confidence in you again so you don't have to run to the IMF. But that means that you have to prove to potential and existing lenders, private sector lenders, that you are on a policy trend to get your financial house in order, to get spending down, uh, the growth of spending down, so that tax revenues brought in will be able to fund what you've promised to pay back. Uh, turning to the IMF is demonstration that you've lost, con you've lost the confidence of the private financial lending community of the world. But then that's your problem. I mean, uh, let us suppose that I rack up a bunch of debt and my income is not enough to meet my minimum payments every month for my debt. Uh, it's going to reach a point where my creditors refuse to extend any more credit to me. I'm going to have to sell off property. I'm going to have to tighten my belt on my, on my daily expenditures to try to meet that and not put any more on my credit cards, even if I have space left on any of them. That's what you have to do. And there has to be the comparable national uh, uh, aspect of this. You see, what people want, this is like in Greece right now. The Greek government spent their economy into financial ruin. Okay? Now the Greek people want their house to be put in order but nothing to be taken away that has caused this financial crisis. They want the government jobs. They want the increases in their retirement pensions. They want to retire earlier to be more eligible for these things. They want all the things that have gotten them into this problem, but the problem to go away. It doesn't work like that. Now, you could say, but it was politicians five years for, in the past, ten years, and now I'm the victim of it. Yeah, you're the victim of it. And that's life. It's life. You have to accept the fact. You can, the government cannot afford what it's been promising you. And you have to, in your private lives and in your communities, find ways to solve the problems as best you can now that the money's run out and the promises are, are basically themselves to bankrupt. Nobody wants to hear that. I assure you that when America may reach that stage, I hope it doesn't, Americans will not want to face that reality, too. That's like human nature, right? You only want to hear the good, not the bad. And particularly when the bad now it tells you you have to do things you don't want to do. That's human nature, but that doesn't change the fact that the party's over. Now, sometimes these work. This happened with, 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 the, Lee, with uh, the, the new Republic of Austria um, with the League of Nations, um, after the First World War, there had been the old Austro-Hungarian Empire, and it broke up into new countries after the First World War. Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Yugoslavia, bigger Romania, and now this new thing that we see on the map of Europe called you know, the Republic of Austria. They ran a huge inflation in the years after the war. They were racking up huge debt and expenses through their version of similar welfare programs at the time, subsidizing food and energy, which they couldn't afford. And finally, they went to the League of Nations to get a loan to, to help them bridge this. 
But the League of Nations actually did the right thing. They said, you don't raise taxes, you cut taxes, and you most importantly, you cut spending and fire government employees. Seven, uh, 70,000 government employees out of a country that only had three million people. And they said, if you do this and deregulate a bit, the private sector economy will have confidence and the resources to recover. Within a year and a half, full employment was restored, the Austrian budget was balanced, and the economy was growing again within a year and a half, two years, after introducing these League of Nations requirements for recovery. Cutting government spending more than taxes were cut. Uh, cu cutting taxes even more than cut spending was cut to have a surplus to help pay off some of the debt. Uh, cut, do that spending cuts by reducing 70,000 bureaucrats. Okay, that's what you said. Yes. And deregulating, yes. And deregulating to get the restriction out of the way for people to use whatever private resources they had to start operating businesses, expanding businesses, starting businesses. Uh, it, 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 luckily, uh, for the government that was in power, uh, the recovery time was shorter than the next election span, so they were rewarded, not punished. Our country is in a country that, um, when you listen to around the world and we hear about, especially in America, when, when they don't get it right, people come out in numbers. Over here, we just say, man, we just, we just say it under our float, and every time we meet each other, the shop paying for the value out of tax, and we say, boy, the artist, but they're wrong for this. But when it was time to really speak out against it, you know, people would just sit down and not really, you know? Right. So, you know, I think no, we need to. Well, that's what that's why I said we have to fire some, some of them so we can just <laughs> fire the government workers, just get some of those payments, some payments going through, you know? See, I, I, I think that a useful election reform would be that on a ballot, you would have candidate X from party X, <laughs> candidate Y from party Y, and then a, none of the above. <laughs> and if none of the above wins, that office is empty for that term. <laughs> it can't be any worse. <laughs> yes. Right. What happens is, is that, uh, and that's happened in Argentina twice in South America. Uh, they, they, they didn't want to introduce either the IMF reforms or any other alternative reforms. Uh, and they could not have paid their creditors because they were not generating enough export sales to have, quote, hard currency to pay their foreign loans. And they just basically defaulted. Uh, they paid a fraction on the dollar. And for a period of time after that, uh, they couldn't get any foreign lending, and they had to just really tighten their belt. And then there'd be a temporary change in the government, and the new government would try to get things in order, things would stabilize, and then the other politicians would come back again. Why are we spending so little? Why, if you only elected us, you know, it's good. Well, everything's okay again. Let's spend. And the cycle would repeat itself. Okay, any other questions or comments? Oh, right, right here? Yes? No, I mean, the rationale behind the spending is not always an explanation because of cronyism. Because of what? Cronyism. Cronyism. Yeah. Oh, yes. That's why you see the spending starts all over again. It's not about, you know, satisfying the needs of the day-to-day the, the -day citizen. Right. So in other words, you're saying that politicians will sometimes spend money to help their friends? I am shocked. This should be in the newspapers. The problem is that's how all of our countries run. You see, this, this is the problem with no restraint on government. What are the limits on government today? Well, there are certain civil liberties, right? In principle, both your country and mine, you have freedom of press, you have freedom of religion, you know, free, you know, freedom to, of speech. But pretty much anything beyond that, the government can do whatever it wants and raise money to cover it, regardless of the motive and reason, such as the type of things you're talking about. It's, 
it's that the fact that there's no limit of like we're saying, you know, even if you don't like this guy's religion, he has freedom of religion. Even if you don't like what this guy is saying, right, he has freedom of speech, because that principle of giving everyone a right to speak their mind is more important than the fact that sometimes you have to put your fingers in the ear because you can't stand what the guy is saying. Okay? The principle is more important, more important than the particular instance that irritates you. It has to be the same way with this issue of what is it that we let government spend money on. Because otherwise they'll keep finding rationales to justify it, either because they, the politician thinks it's right or serving his friends. Uh, in the United States, what, what is referred to as the Freedom of Information Act, uh, this was passed back after the Vietnam War, because the U.S. government shockingly did things in a sneaky way. I mean, I can't believe a government would do something in a sneaky way, hiding it from the public, but, you know, things happen. And so uh, they passed this Freedom of Information Act that, that you could uh, appeal to a certain government department that unless it could be justified and demonstrated that this was something involving, like, national security, lives, uh, after a certain period of time, you should have access to that information. In other words, what's going on behind closed doors, to some extent, uh, behind government policies, reasoning, arguments, and so on. Uh, that has brought a lot of things to the, to the light of day that otherwise wouldn't have been known. Um, uh, and I, I, I think that, that any country should have some version of that. See, I mean, I mean in Britain, they have this, like, the Official Secrets Act. You, 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 you can't see certain things until 100 years. But by that time, it's a dead issue. I want to know what government was doing two years ago, because that's still relevant to me. Not what it was doing 100 years ago. Now, as in a, if someone is an historian, what the government was doing 100 years ago could be interesting, right? It's the history of the country. But it's dead for you and me. You want to know what the hell they're doing yesterday? Because yesterday is affecting you today. Okay. These are a lot of good questions. Anything else? Right. But in this country, um, which is considered a third world country, although we don't really look at ourselves that way, um, if you if you if you are not a part of a certain organization, especially a political organization, or you have the church or someone behind you, uh -huh. and you were to speak out on certain things, um, uh -huh. you, you would in some way invisibly be. Um, um, reprimanded by, 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 you know, they, they just, they just start to come at you, you know, and they, even if they got to, like, okay, for instance, we have a brother here, I don't think all of his policies are correct, he's, he's not a political, I think he went into political arena also, but mm -hmm. he's always, um, because of the violence in the country, saying, well, hang, mm -hmm. hang, hang, hang. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't really believe in all of his issues of, of capital punishment, but, you know, he, he got... Because of, some, because of his mouth, you know, he got put in prison one time. And he was not the only person, especially in the old regimes, um, like in the 70s, in the 80s, 70s. Mm -hmm. If you speak out against those brothers, you know, um, you get victimized pretty hard. Nowadays, it's not as bad, mm -hmm. but um, it's still that invisible law there. Well, in the United States, the, we have a number of watchdog organizations mm -hmm. that in most cases prevent that from happening. Uh, the courts and uh, legal associations such as the American Civil Liberties Union often will, uh, or the, there's a gr another group called the Institute of Justice, they will take, uh, usually for no fee, cases that involve basic liberties of one type or another to prevent abuse or, or, or violation. And uh, so, so do people have their, their, their rights, such as freedom of speech, bent? Uh, I'm talking about in the United States, I'm being rhetorical, bent, yes. But it's much more difficult because there's a lot of voices that are looking to see that that doesn't happen. Now, the government plays other games in the U.S. Let's suppose a reporter uh, is reporting things that the government doesn't want really to be released. And let's suppose that reporter is assigned to, like, cover the White House, right, the president. Well, he doesn't get invited to ask questions at the news briefings or he doesn't get the background, you know, off-the-record comments that the other reporters, you know, you get shunned, that basically shuts you out and limits your ability to do your reporting job because 
they, they've decided that you've been too, quote, unfriendly. Now, uh, it, it's very rare for someone to go to jail for those types of things. Usually only when a judge says, you have to tell us who your source was for something you reported, right, the anonymous source, uh, and you refuse to, and the judge, sa judge says, you're put in jail for contempt. But except for cases like that, it's few and far between. Yes, Institute of Justice and the American Civil Liberties Union. Well, I'm getting the signal that that ends it. Thank you very much. <laughs>